this is a talk I had to put together for another m meeting, so I took some of that, that talk and I thought maybe some of these things could perhaps be relevant to make things even more complicated of something where I have a goal to make it simple. But anyway, I guess take, take it as uh, what I'm, what I've, I'm did, seeing from the literature using population genomics and what seems to be emerging in terms of things related to the, the potential of species to to maintain their adaptive potential in the face of environmental change. So, <laughs> so it starts with um, what we can call the biological realism or not of current models inspired by the quantitative trait nucleotide program of if you want people that are in search of these magical genes of very large effect and giving the impression that it seems to explain everything. So I think the literature have been driven a lot by this until recently. So basically models per pertaining to environmental adaptation, uh, I think commonly assume that phenotypic traits are controlled by single genes uh, driven to fixation by, uh, by selection. That's kind of the, the basic, of course there are uh, variants of that, but that's, that's really what's being driving the, the way we're seeing things. So <laughs> that I would, I would argue that brings us into having some sort of a gloomy perspective because the way we, we see that in a, let's see, in a textbook cartoon, Strong selection will drive reduction in population size, which leads to reduction of diversity, lead to reduction of evolutionary potential, and increased risk of, um, of extinction. <laughs> but perhaps the, that, that vision uh, underestimates species, the species' capacity to retain their evolutionary potential. Uh, after all, I guess we all know that organisms sometimes can adapt surprisingly quickly to new environmental conditions. And that can happen sometimes even when census sizes are very small, like, like, just like in domestic breeds. <laughs> and it's becoming clearer and clearer that there's a prevailing role for standing genetic variation in adaptation, which means that somewhere, somehow, genetic diversity is being maintained, at least in some circumstances. So clearly, there are mechanisms by which genetic variation and evolutionary potential can be maintained in natural populations, but perhaps we don't pay enough attention to, uh, to those. And this is not an exclusive list, but those are, are the fate of these, um, these five mechanisms I will briefly touch, uh, touch on during the 15 or 20 minutes I have, which are the prevalence of soft sweeps, polygenic basis of adaptation, balancing selection and transient polymorphism associated with it, recurrent parallel evolution, and epigenetic variation. <coughs> So the prevalence of soft sweeps, theoretical and empirical, re there are, uh, theoretical and empirical reasons to suspect that hard sweeps, uh, large, so large effect QTNs are not the most informative uh, in explaining the general evolutionary phenomenon. That has been well, uh, I think, covered by uh, uh, Roxman evolution uh, paper. <laughs> it's, it's clear also, at least in the human literature, that fixed differences among human populations uh, seems to be exceptionally rare. And uh, most well-known example of rapid molecular uh, adaptation, particularly so in, urum, uh, in humans, but elsewhere, show signature of soft selecting sweeps as opposed to hard sweeps. Not to say that hard sweeps don't exist, but the general rule is more like about soft sweeps, which is about switch in uh, uh, allele frequencies from standing genetic variation. So as one, uh, let's say taxonomic exam uh, uh, example of that, uh, from the world I know best, the fish, allele fixation doesn't seem to underlie local adaptation. If we, I mean, observation based from uh, recent genome scan, population genomics uh, <laughs> with uh, SNPs uh, database. So that's a typical, one of the typical figures you would see in genome scans uh, in, fish pop in fish populations, the FST distribution among markers along the chromosomes, and then you have these outliers. Where are they? They're not at fixation. They are at intermediate allele frequencies. They are highly divergent, but they maintain variation in the sense of what we see is variation uh, of, the, of the same alleles among population, but variation in the face of adaptation is, is being maintained. Uh, for anadromous fish or marine fishes or freshwater fishes, <laughs> this is like, this is the, uh, the range of uh, FST values for outliers re reported in several um, studies that I would consider representative of the, of the fish literature. So very, very rarely you, see, you, you reach uh, actual fixation. Even when you get very high FST values, it still means that you're maintaining 
allelic diversity in the system. You're not going to complete fixation. So if selection goes in another direction, the variation is still potentially there for selection to act upon and drive allele frequencies elsewhere. <laughs> Polygenic basis of adaptation. Um, I guess we all know, but we don't pay attention to it often enough. Evolution most, perhaps most often acts via large number of small uh, effect polygenes. And the prediction here <coughs> will be that polygenic selection should not lead to fixation, but instead lead to uh, uh, generate small co-varying changes in allele frequencies. Again, the situation where uh, selection will, will not uh, lead to gen total genetic erosion. A good example of that, human hate and uh, so-called missing heritability. <coughs> Initial studies, so uh, human hate is a highly heritable trait. Um, the the uh, first, like with very high resolution GWAS type of studies focusing on looking for association locus by locus, could not explain more than 5% of the variance in human hate, even when using hundreds of thousands of SNPs. And when somebody had the idea of thinking more in a polygenic framework, <laughs> Yang and Collins back in 2010, so using more of a multivariate analysis, which uh, would consider covariation among, uh, among uh, multiple loci, uh, they ended up being able to explain 45% of the human aid variation based on, geno on the genomic variation. So just to say <laughs> that thinking polygenic can bring us elsewhere. One quick example in fish, yeah. They consider, yeah, they consider like the whole, the whole data set, and out of that, uh, out of that, they identified the few hundreds or few thousand SNPs that together co-vary to explain 45% of the, of the variation. <coughs> Stuff that we have done on uh, eels recently. So eel is very uh, interesting because one species equal one population, it's total panmixia. So by definition, local adaptation does not, cannot really uh, exist and evolve in the long term in, that, uh, in a species like that. But still, it's a species that, uh, that uh, use, a, uh, use a widely heterogeneous uh, uh, habitat in the coastal and freshwater once they, after they have uh, reproduced in the Sargasso Sea, larval drift towards the continent. And they can spend the entire uh, life in uh, Mexico and the m more stupid ones spend their life in, up in Quebec in the winter and so on. Or they can spend their life uh, entirely in freshwater before going back for reproduction, or decide to spend their entire life in coastal, brackish, marine areas as well. <laughs> and, and when they, they do so, freshwater versus uh, uh, brackish, uh, uh, brackish saltwater areas, th that's associated with, I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, pretty strong phenotypic uh, differentiation in life, uh, in life history traits and so on. <laughs> so just to show that uh, this is a species which is totally at, at the fourth decimal, there's just no variation no matter how you look at the data. So this is the best negative result you can get based on neutral markers. <laughs> but then we look, at, uh, we look at SNP data based on uh, using random forest algorithm, uh, which actually could identify these, uh, these markers that could uh, co-vary co uh, with slight differences in allele frequencies, co-vary to discriminate eels that spend their life in freshwater as opposed to eels that spend their life in, in uh, uh, freshwater versus brackish marine wa uh, waters. And so basically the story is that we found these uh, out of uh, 40,000 SNPs, we found these 300 something SNPs that co-vary together and that could, uh, that could discriminate 90% blindly and uh, as opposed to ran random variation to discriminate uh, these ecotypes that eels that spend their time in freshwater or saltwater. At, with a 95, 90% uh, success rate. And this is within a panmictic uh, situation, which means it's either that this, these, uh, these uh, genomic regions are associated with, uh, with habitat choice, with a behavior, uh, behavior, but more likely when we put other aspects of, of our knowledge on eel, it's more, most likely reflect the effect of specially varying selection that is acting in a one generation basis. And then all of this is being reshuffled every generation. So you start with a totally panmictic population and then selection over one generation generate these <laughs> change in allele frequencies that go vary together. So this is a strong polygenic signal of uh, selection. So <laughs> the next, uh, next aspect, balancing selection and transient polymorphism. So 
I guess we can quote uh, Mike Whitlock here, right? This is the absolute truth. When Mike says something, this is the truth. It is reasonable to believe that whatever genetic variation is preserved by spatial balancing selection, uh, preserved by spatial balancing selection, is likely to be more useful in allowing to the population to respond to future challenges than other mechanisms that maintain genetic variation. <laughs> Yet we don't pay attention at all to balancing selection because it's it's complicated, right? But it still exists and it's it's still important. So complicated because balancing selection can take different forms, frequency dependent selection, heterozygous advantage, selection that varies in space and time, antagonistic evolution within species, disassortative mating. So various mechanisms that are somewhere somehow associated with the general concept of balancing selection. <laughs> One of my best empirical uh, um, uh, illustration that balancing selection can be in action in natural population is this amazing work by, uh, by uh, Petkov's group uh, published a couple of years ago that basically documented rapid and stable adaptive oscillation over hundreds and hundreds of markers in the, in the, in the flies genomes uh, through the season. So <laughs> bunch of, bunch of uh, loci that varies in frequencies in the same direction, let's say towards the spring to the fall and so on over a time frame of a couple of years. So these, these, uh, these loci co-vary to, to together and don't ask me to explain the, the, the link to it, but basically in the paper they explain how this variation is also associated with change in fitness related to some uh, thermal resistant traits in, uh, in, uh, <coughs> in the flies. So I think this is a pretty striking illustration, but it shows basically that you maintain this allelic variation, selection acting in one direction in one season, in the other direction in another season, at many markers at once. So this is a strong signal again of uh, select, of uh, of polygenic uh, selection. <laughs> so, um, so you expect that, uh, that maintenance of adaptive polymorphism by balancing selection could prevail in many species, either plants or, or animals, especially in situations where you have physical few physical barriers to dispersal during, uh, during the young life history stages. And in situation like the, let's say like the eel, for example, but you can think of many other species where heterogeneous environment uh, va uh, vary in time and space and where there's weak phylopetry at the adult uh, stage. So in, the, in such cases, <coughs> theory will predict that genetic, genetic polymorphism will be maintained by a balance between selection and dispersal across this heterogeneous uh, landscape. So again, all of that at the end, maintaining genetic variation within the species. So that seems a bit of a, of that, uh, apparently like a bit of a paradox because if you have, um, if adaptation proceed by these small change in allele frequencies with relatively small selection coefficient on each locus uh, that, uh, that are responsible for the acting together for the expression of a given phenotype, then you would expect that a, a system that w which is linked by migration, that migration should link to a, a swapping of these adaptive alleles and then adaptation should be, uh, should be complicated. <laughs> so Sam Yemen addressed this, uh, this um, actual particular problem uh, last year and uh, basically showed by this uh, simulation and modeling approach that local adaptation could evolve uh, in with, with uh, change involving many loci with small co selection coefficient acti acting on each of them if there is sufficient genetic variation uh, and if there's redund redundancy in the genome, meaning that you can have different, uh, different loci that can play more or less the same, the same role, and that exists, that has been redundancy in the genome is something that has been well documented. And uh, so in such cases, you can predict that you could have temporal turnover of genes responsible for adaptive divergence. So what, <laughs> so what uh, Sam has done is basically he has simulated populations, uh, uh, populations over, over time in, a, in an adaptation, uh, local adaptation context. And uh, so you have, and then show like these hundreds of, uh, of loci that are associated with, say, with, the, uh, with an adaptive trait that is under selection through these generations. And basically what he showed is that the, the, the intensity of the color uh, <laughs> it reflects the, uh, the importance of a given locus in controlling uh, the, the adaptive trait uh, in question. So let's see if you take, you take one here, you are at the, um, let's see this at the onset of the simulation here. So you have this locus here, 
with these uh, dark uh, blue traits. It's made at the beginning. This locus was at the explained relatively uh, important part of the variance of the variation in that trait, but then his role was, uh, as was declining over time and was taken over by another, lo uh, another locus and so on. So this is what is, what is, is, <laughs> is coined as transient polymorphism, and then basically different combination of loci could control the evolution of the, of the same uh, phenotypic trait. So you could lose potentially variation at one locus, but it's the, its role is going to be taken over by, an, by another region in the genome. So that, again, gives option to species to cope with, um, with environmental change. <coughs> Quickly on uh, recurrent parallel evolution. Uh, obviously, there are numerous, numerous empirical studies, both in plants and animals, that provided evidence for parallel evolution to solve the same environmental problems. Those are two very classic examples. But the main point here is that, well, first of all, parallel evolution is not like a total, is not is not uh, something totally uncommon. It happens more than, than I think we thought. But also it can occur through the repeated use of the same genetic variants, but also uh, uh, with, uh, under very different uh, genetic uh, architecture. So you may have, uh, in some cases, at least different genetic solution for same uh, phenotypic or adaptive problem. <laughs> and that seems to be, um, depends on, the, on several Thing, so you cannot make a general rule of that. The number of possible mutations capable of producing adaptive change will depend on the particular proteins under consideration. So let's see where the protein is in the, within the network. Is it a, is it a hub gene or not? Uh, the nature of the selected phenotype is the historical contingency. But the bottom line is that <laughs> repeated evolution is, uh, is uh, not a rare phenomenon, and it may involve different genetic architecture and from my understanding of the literature, perhaps more commonly, uh, different genetic, genetic architecture than the same uh, genetic basis. Of course, Sally, you would disagree with that. You just published something in the other way in sci science, but <laughs> right, <laughs> that happens. Okay, last point, epigenetic variation. <laughs> um, so, of course, by theory, impoverished genetic diversity, and this is, I guess, why we are here largely, about you know, worrying about genetic erosion related with small population size. Genetic diversity commonly documented, <coughs> obviously, in isolated population with highly reduced NE and so on. So, theoretically, that should, lit that should consistently severely compromise the adaptive potential uh, of, sp of species or population, but it seems from the literature that it's not necessarily always the case. So something else seems to be going on. I really like that uh, recent paper from Dylan Fraser's group in Concordia in Montreal. <laughs> in the really cool experimental work where he, um, he brought this trout population in the lab and, uh, and they come from, in, the, from the, in nature, they come from um, population with census size and effective population size that vary tremendously from 50 fold to, uh, for the census size and 10 fold in terms of any and basically he did the experiments to see if uh, the level of plasticity related to temperature with and, and the, the plasticity of some adaptive related traits uh, related uh, with plasticity related to temperature, if uh, there was an, an effect of census size or effective population size on the, on the plastic potential of species and also the, the actual uh, f uh, fitness of, the, of these uh, <laughs> related with these, uh, these traits um, in experimental conditions. So the, ba the, ba the basic thing is that he observed no, ev no evidence for difference in plasticity and, uh, and, and uh, fitness uh, in these adaptive uh, traits in this setting, actually. So that led the uh, <laughs> his co-author at the end of the paper to propose that even very small population of some species might have the ability to respond to climate change. So obviously that doesn't come from in this case, at least, you had population of any of 10 or something like that. Basically, they were totally homozygous at microsatellites, previous studies he has done. So in this particular case, perhaps the, um, the, this ability uh, comes from elsewhere. <laughs> and perhaps it lies in the, at the level of epigenetic variation. So we can ask the question, uh, could epigenetic variation increase the potential of a species to quickly adapt to environmental change? So it, Epigenetic variation clearly meets the requirements to be acted on by natural selection. It is ubiquitous. Uh, 
It controls the expression of adaptive traits, and we know now that can be inherited over several generations and even longer than that <laughs> on an evolutionary time scale as well. So a uh, really cool example that I, <laughs> that I like to uh, illustrate the possible role of, uh, of epigenetic variation in, um, uh, in, in adaptation is this uh, study that was uh, published in that special issue on epigenetics uh, that was led by uh, Victoria Sork, uh, published this year. <laughs> so basically, uh, just to make a short, uh, a long story short, they, uh, they, uh, they, they showed that there was variation in the level of, uh, level of um, the proportion of methylated, uh, uh, single methylation, single methylation variant position <laughs> that, uh, that, var that varies with, uh, with the, the thermal landscape, if you want, in this uh, oak, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Valley Oak uh, distribution in, uh, in California. And they showed, for example, that uh, the level, the, the proportion of, methylated, uh, of methylation in this particular uh, genomic region uh, was uh, associated with, uh, with the mean uh, average temperature encountered by the, uh, by the oak in the ver various locations. So, and then they performed some sort of a epigenome scan to show that they had the, they had the methylated uh, outliers uh, associated with population, oak population from different uh, thermal uh, environments. So it's some of the empirical studies conducted in the field that, that, uh, that uh, are increasingly showing the role of epigenetic variation. And of course, we're just starting slowly to, to get into that. But I think because we're doing population genomics and we have the tool to easily do that kind of stuff now, we cannot really ignore it. And we have to think about it in the stuff that I guess we'll be talking about today in the next uh, couple of days. <laughs> so to me, the situation is, uh, perhaps a bit less gloomy than currently assumed, because uh, adaptive evolution seems to almost never involve the fixation of beneficial alleles. So <coughs> most of the times, uh, diversity seems to be maintained to some extent. And that's partly because selection of mainly operates in the form of soft sweeps. Evolution proceeds most commonly via a high number of small effect polygenes. So that means weak selective effect on each, uh, on each of these polygenes. Balancing selection plays a role, and perhaps transient polymorphism. We still have a lot to learn about the role of transient polymorphism, but it, that's most likely more common than we currently considered in, in all of the stuff that we're doing. Repeated evolution with or without the same genetic architecture uh, is common, and epigenetic variation could possibly play a role, um, an important role in rapid adaptation, and it's another source of variation upon which uh, species can count to evolve in the future. <laughs>